That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Midnight Sky, the seventh film directed by George Clooney, which will be available on Netflix as of December 23rd, 2020. All right. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain this story. Is that okay? Yeah. It's set in 2049. Mm -hmm. February of 2049. There is an extinction level event that's imminent. Mm -hmm. We find George Clooney's character, Augustine. Mm -hmm. He's some sort of research scientist in the Antarctic at like a research center and everyone's being evacuated to go somewhere. And it's in three weeks after the said event had happened. Correct. He chooses not to go. He doesn't want to evacuate. He wants to be left alone at the research center uh, because he has a terminal illness. So, that requires constant blood transfusions. Yes. All right. So the story has sort of like two narratives uh, paralleled. So it's Augustine at the research center in the Antarctic, and then a team of um, like scientists slash astronauts in their vessel in space returning from like a, a, like a survey, like a survey of like a site where they are going to build or have built colonies uh, for humans to sort of flee to. Mm -hmm. But all of what's happening is not made clear at all. So it's more about what's happening at that moment. Like it's in the course of like the day that we see that George Clooney's character does not want to leave. And also this group of astronauts are returning and they have not been able to communicate with anyone for several weeks. Mm -hmm. So they don't know what's happening. So he meaning like they couldn't get comms with like the US with China, Russia, anyone. So they've just been traveling back. Right. And he, I guess, knows that they are hurtling back to Earth and don't know what they're about to meet. He's so. sitting in the command center and he sees on a screen that there's one vessel out there that's like in motion. He wants to communicate with them, but the satellite signal, something wherever he is, is not adequate. So he has to um, go to another site. Like he has to walk or hike to another site in this like blizzard in the Antarctic to then send the signal. But before he does that, a small girl, mm -hmm. like a six or seven year old girl appears. With elective mutism, apparently. <laughs> she can't speak. She seems very uh, happy to be there though. Yeah. And she just clings to him like a puppy. Mm -hmm. So he chooses to drag this little girl along on this trek. So the bulk of the story for him is him trying to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. He is successful at getting to point B where he communicates with eventually to the people in the shuttle telling them basically like, don't bother coming back and this has happened. The group of people on the shuttle, um, There's five of them. there are five of them, who are they? Uh, there's the flight commander, played by David Oyelowo. Uh, Felicity Jones is Sully, who he has impregnated. Um, David Oyelowo yes. has impregnated. Felicity Jones. Yeah. Uh, Tiffany Boone is Maya. Uh, Kyle Chandler is Mitchell. And Demian Bashir is Sanchez. Maya's the black lady? Yeah. So, nothing much happens on the ship. They're very calm because they don't know what's going on until close to the end. And even then, they still stay They're chill. just speculating why they can't get a hold of anybody. Right. And in fact, one of David Oyelowo's... Because um, uh, some of them have brief uh, moments of narration over montage of images and he he makes a comment about how if it was a less professional crew they would be in a panic right now well unlucky for the viewer because that shit was boring anyway a lot of what they do is they're looking like in many sci-fi films like hologram like voice messages or hologram memories of people they, they are able to sit in an environment where there are holograms of their loved ones around them yeah just looking at other people's. It was about as interesting as looking at someone else's photo album. But anyway, they, um, the only sort of event that occurs is there's a meteor shower sort of earlier on that, that uh, causes damage to the vessel. So then later on, when uh, some of them go out to repair it, Maya, the black lady, She's injured. They're hit with debris as what usually happens in- And she films. loses her life. The end of the story is, oh God, this was the worst part to me. So it's very obvious from the beginning that the little girl who George Clooney is interacting with, I thought was either like a ghost or a figment of his imagination, which it is, 
it turns out that that little girl, what's her little, what's her name? The little girl's name is Iris, which we learn because she's drawing irises, and when he says that flower's name out loud, she responds to it. Oh my God, the pregnant bitch on the ship is Augustine's daughter. But he didn't know that. Well, she her nickname is Sully, so fools the audience. And then she introduces herself to him as Iris, and he says, I, I know already, I believe. And then you get a flashback of that little girl. So the one ship that's still out there left roaming around, which does make sense that he was so motivated to warn her, but is in the, that is her daughter. A ship called the Ether. She's out and there the young girl there. he's been sort of like dragging along with him. Is sort of her be as, because, like as a figment of his imagination. Because watching it is like, why would you bring this little girl in the snowstorm? Like, I would show her where the food is. Oh, 100%. But before we get into that, the end of the film, I actually wrote a note because I wasn't clear the film had ended when it ended because literally it's just the remaining. Because the man, Klaus Bang, or uh, who's the head Klaus, of. Klaus Bang, Kyle Chandler. Kyle Chandler, he, he does. After. Augustine warns them, like, don't bother coming back to Earth. Uh, Kyle says, no, that was our mission. We're coming back. And everyone's like, no, we should probably go back to the colony. He finally agrees, like, okay, I'll take one of the escape pods and I'll go back to Earth. Y'all can go back to the colony. So they do that. And then the end of the film is just the remaining three crew members, just like at the command station of this vessel. Two. Just two. My's dead. Weren't there five total? Demi and Bashir and Kyle Chandler go back to Oh, the they both escaped. So it's just the, the... The couple. The couple left on this vessel. And we just see them kind of like, boop, 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 chilling, going back. And then the credits roll. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I know this is based on a book. Uh, Lily Brooks Dalton, who uh, I believe was also credited as consulting producer. Okay, good for her. Uh, it was adapted by Mark L. Smith. Uh, who, of course, was the screenwriter on The Revenant and Overlord, which are both films I liked. So before I sound too ridiculous, I do think this story, like knowing that it's based on a novel, I think probably makes for a very compelling read because we get more sort of a, a character study of these people sort of on the interior of this major event that we know nothing about. And I think that's fascinating because for like a sci-fi apocalypse film, this will disappoint a lot of people mm -hmm. because we don't know anything about what's going on. There isn't really any action. We, there are spaceships and, you know, the galaxy, but it's not. This is a drama, really. Sure. Um, but I think if I were to have read this novel, I probably would have enjoyed it. Yeah. Especially, I thought, like, the George Clooney character, the fact that the world's ending and he has a terminal condition, he seems to be very at peace with what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think getting to understand that character's thoughts would be very in, a very interesting read. But in the film, we really don't get anything. Yeah, I think I was hoping it would be a little more like that Robert Redford film where he's lost at sea on the boat. Uh, the title is eluding me right now. Um, it, it, I, it seemed like Clooney, who I'm really not a fan, looking over his filmography as a director, besides like Good Night and Good Luck, maybe Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, um, I, I don't really like most of his directorial efforts. And it seems, if you're going to have a glacially paced sci-fi film, if you can't do Tarkovsky, because Soderbergh couldn't even do Tarkovsky, and I always get the sense that Clooney's wanted to be like Soderbergh, uh, which is a criticism that I understand rubs him the wrong way considerably, but uh, triggered. Okay. I don't think that it is up to snuff. I well, I thought this film was like if you took sort of like a more dry apocalypse film. Mm -hmm. What's the one with Brad Pitt? 12 Monkeys? No. Where he's in space. Ad Astra. If you took something like Ad Astra like, and put it on Xanax and antidepressants, I feel like that's how this film felt. I liked Ad Astra. Uh, and Ad Astra I thought you were going to say I like antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Xanax and, uh, never mind. Um, Ad Astra, which is basically Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness in Space. Um, this was, and they directly, re there's a couple interesting references in here. One, Ethan Peck, who's the grandson of Gregory Peck, plays the younger version of George Clooney in a couple flashback scenes. Because as a young man, that was this was his research, is discovering a, another planet where we could, eventually humans would have to migrate to. Um, 
and he's dubbed over with George Clooney's voice. But uh, the film that this most clearly resembles uh, is directly referenced. Uh, Stanley Kramer's 1956 film On the Beach, uh, which you see a, at least a reflection of somebody watching it in the film with Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner. Um, th that is the vein of this film. And, and that film is also, because you were talking about how this is kind of an original take and that we don't have any specifics about the apocalypse, but really that kind of has been done before, and it has, and that was in the 50s. Um, again, that was, it's hinted at that it's nuclear warfare that has caused it, but we don't really know what is causing the extinction of humans. It's just that all these, the last surviving members of the human race are stuck in this boat outside of Australia, which is the last place that hasn't been hit by this fallout. Well, I'll just get, go through my notes. I really did not like the music in oh, this film. So that's uh, Alexandre Desplat, who is, but has been nominated for 11 Academy Awards. Uh, he's a very notable film composer. Uh, and I believe he won the Oscar for his score for Grand Budapest Hotel. If you got on your iMac desktop computer and put on the Spa channel and then let those little stock images play as the screensaver, that's how this movie felt to me. <laughs> I agree because we are almost always called attention to the score at times where it's really unnecessary, such as early scenes within the, the, the uh, spaceship with the crew members. There's kind of this jaunty... It's corny. To, yeah. Yeah. It, um, it, and then there's like a sing-along to Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline. Yes. Which, which I thought was corny. I did not need right before Disaster Strikes, of course. The... The... The Maya character, mm -hmm. she puts, when the pregnant lady realizes like there's something wrong, they put her, Maya puts her in a machine, which is like doing like diagnostic imaging or something. And she explains to her that this machine is intended to detect like alien life forms that have invaded the body. Mm -hmm. And the pregnant lady makes a joke like, well, same thing basically. I thought that was so weird because it just seems like these people on this vessel don't really know, like, I just don't understand what they know about anything. The fact that she's having to explain this machine to her, and I don't know if that was intended to be a joke, but then if it is a joke, it feels oddly, it just feels misplaced. That bothered me. There is nothing thrilling in this film. Like, when Augustine, George Clooney's character, is making his way from point A to point B, he comes across like a plane that has crashed mm -hmm. and there is a man in the plane who is not yet dead and he's startled by him mm -hmm. and that's the only sort of like like boo moment well then he and, then, shoots and then he has to shoot him to put him out of his misery well and then he has to shoot at some creatures that might be wolves there's also a scene where he goes outside and there's birds that have migrated north that are like freezing to death in the arctic circle yeah um i like those kind of details uh it but no, that's the only thing giving us like right. any like any life to this movie. Right, and I, I just didn't feel any kind of uh, connection to any of these characters. And the plot mechanism that unites father and daughter, I thought, was contrived. Yes, and getting to the daughter, I think introducing this little mute girl who is clearly not in distress so early on, I think was maybe in the book, it's she seems more real because we're inside his head and you know we, we like we don't know what's real if we're inside someone's head but i think the depiction of it is such that she is such a prominent hallucination that his it, it would have been more interesting if the whole thing had been a, depicted as a hallucination or that. <laughs> uh yeah that's all i have yeah i don't know this I, was not a, an entertaining movie to watch i don't think the visuals were arresting like the the space images were not i actually thought some of them looked kind of well especially compared to say gravity which george clooney had a small role in uh and how that looked on the screen but even early on the pregnant lady is dreaming and we see her like out in like like on this foreign planet and that looked very like very green screen it looked like in a, and also the visuals were like 50s sci-fi of the the foliage and the, yes. the colors, yeah. And then when the meteor shower occurred, I I didn't think that it looked... But that's what happens in gravity as well. Like but gravity looked, looked better. Yeah, but but the same mechanism of like, oh, the, when you're repairing the ship on the exterior, you're going to be hit by debris. Sure. 
What would you give this movie? Uh, two out of five. Oh, and also, oh. they're at the Barbeau Observatory. The Adrian Barbeau Observatory. And I was like, is that an Adrian Barbeau reference because of the fog? Because Barbeau, I mean, I don't know. Who's the director? Oh, George Clooney. Ask him. I don't know. I would give it two out of five as well. Actually, I would give it one and a half out of five. I did not enjoy this film. Anything else? No. Bye. Bye.